the greatest of all time. Those words in a social gathering signal danger. They are the rumbling of thunder from an oncoming catastrophic storm, the rattling of the train tracks on which you are currently standing. If you are at a party and you hear the words, the greatest of all time, people are about to argue. What's the greatest horror movie of all time? What's the greatest rock album of all time? If you ask a group of nerdy 30-somethings, which is the best Final Fantasy of all time, you're about to see bloodshed. Get out your phone, either to record the mayhem or to call 911. And these are wordy debates. People come with charts, graphs, figures, manifestos. They have a million reasons why their favorite 1970s golden age shoujo manga is in fact the best 1970s golden age shoujo manga. But the truth is, a lot of the time, those objective reasons obscure the deeply personal and intimate ways that we actually connect with media. You list 30 major tropes that your favorite horror movie subverts, but you leave out the fact that you watched it during your favorite summer of your teenage years. You invoke the complex music theory that makes your favorite rock album legendary, and you leave out the fact that your cool, mysterious aunt gave you a copy on your birthday. My favorite Final Fantasy is Seven. Don't tell Nine that I said that. And yes, I have a million reasons that I could give you as to why Final Fantasy VII is great, the greatest of all time. But while it won't win me any debates at a party, it's probably worth mentioning that Final Fantasy VII is the first Final Fantasy that I ever played. In these debates about the greatest of all time, we categorize and rationalize feelings that hit us faster than we can actually form words to describe them. We struggle to make cold and objective that which is deeply intimate and personal. And your firsts are intimate and personal. They set expectations for you. They open your eyes to new possibilities. My favorite Final Fantasy is the first one that I played, but it's not the first Japanese role-playing game I played. Well before I ever wrote a chocobo, I played a game written by a man named Hidenori Shibao. Japanese role-playing games have been a major part of my life for 24 years. When JRPGs dominated the landscape of the PlayStation 1, I sat in front of a big boxy TV playing them. When they fell out of fashion in my late teens, I sought out bygone consoles and plundered bargain bins to keep the genre alive in my tiny corner of the universe. In college, my childhood experiences with JRPGs gave me a common language with people who went on to become my best and closest friends, and ever since then I've been scouring the fringes of gaming history for obscure, forgotten JRPG gems. All of that passion and obsession can be traced back to my first, to the first JRPG I ever played, Legend of Lagaya. My first JRPG didn't actually make a good first impression on me. The print ads for Lagaya were frightening and intense, and when I was eight, that was not my style. I was an absolute scaredy cat wimp. I used to ask my parents to flip through new issues of Electronic Gaming Monthly so they could tear out all the ads for Resident Evil, ads so horrifying that they made me dread turning the pages. Basically, if it was scarier than Goosebumps, it was too spicy for me. As a certified wimp, the horror-themed ads about the toxic mist of Legend of Lagaya did not win me over. But then the game showed up again on a demo disc, and for whatever reason, I gave it a try. The moment I finished that demo, I begged my parents to buy the full game. I'd played other video games before, your Bandicoot's Crash and your Hedgehog's Sonic, but nothing else had such a sense of adventure, such a grand scope, such a unique and fully realized world as Legend of Lagaya. I loved it when I played it then, I loved it when I replayed it in my shoebox college dorm, and I love it when I play it today. Legend of Lagaya was my first. It set expectations for me, it opened my eyes to new possibilities, and I know that's a fundamental part of why I love it. But I don't think that's the whole story. I truly don't believe it's just nostalgia keeping Legend of Lagaya alive in my heart. The unorthodox stylistic influences, the alien, bizarre qualities of the world. When I started researching this video essay, I truly felt that there was something vital and unique about Legend of Lagaya that was worth exploring more fully, and I wanted to prove it, directly in spite of my all-consuming bias. But researching that one game led to researching about its writer, Hidenori Shibao, who passed away in 2018. And that led to playing the two games he made before Lagaya, and that led to me finding his blog, which has been scrubbed completely off the face of the internet, but which has been preserved 
by the Internet Archive. Years of daily journal entries. So this project expanded. Yes, I do want to talk about Legend of Lagaya. I want to convince you that it shreds, that it is a vital, unique, and fascinating experience, and you should play it. But I also want to talk about Hidenori Shibao, a wild soul with a reckless passion for life, a man who wrote prolifically by day and then indulged in legendary debauchery until the sunrise. I want to talk about two Super Famicom games that were decades ahead of their time, and about one PlayStation game that was in deep tension with itself. I want to talk about ancient Rome and archangels. I want to talk about catastrophe, about agony, and about a random line of NPC dialogue that genuinely keeps me awake at night. I want to convince you to play Legend of Ligaia, and I want to memorialize a man that I've come to admire. So, let's get started. In 1970, Osaka, Japan held a World's Fair, the first in the country's history. The theme of the fair was progress and harmony for mankind. Expo 70 was attended by more than 64 million people, a record for World's Fair attendance at the time. At Expo 70, you could journey inside artist Taro Okamoto's Tower of the Sun and discover a tree of life inside that depicted aeons of evolution. You could examine a moon rock brought back to Earth by Apollo 12 astronauts. You could watch mariachi bands perform live, mingle with visitors from around the world on carnival rides, and view the fairgrounds from high up in a gondola lift. The artists and architects participating in Expo 70 were adventurous and avant-garde, and they came from countries around the world. For the local kids living in an era decades before the advent of the internet, the Expo was a glimpse into a vivid world of radical diversity. And for one kid, whose dad drove him 400 miles overnight to get to the Expo, it was truly an unforgettable experience. Hidenori Shibao was only seven years old when he attended the Expo, and for the rest of his life, he would use the World's Fair as an analogy to explain the guiding philosophy behind his video game design practices. When people ask what video games are like, particularly role-playing games, I always think the World's Fair is the closest comparison. There are all these little pavilions you can visit, and each one is like another country, offering a completely different experience. Meanwhile, in role-playing games, you travel the world, visiting a variety of towns, dungeons, and having adventures. And I think those are very similar experiences. At the expo, you're asking, what can I get to eat in here? And in games, you're asking, what sort of magic can I get in here? Shibao cherished the sense of adventure he felt at Expo 70, and he never stopped chasing it, in his games or in his real life. As an adult, he traveled extensively, eager to challenge himself with new experiences. But as a kid, he only had two windows into the wider world, his beloved shortwave radio and the distant realms of genre fiction. <coughs> One of the most impactful pieces of fiction Shibao experienced in his youth was Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, a film that initiated a lifelong love of science fiction in general and Star Wars in specific. The sense of wild and authentic alien diversity captured his imagination. So did the blend of sword, spirituality, and sorcery in Borman's Excalibur. If you know how and where to look for it, you'll actually find Excalibur's influence in a lot of incredible video games. Shibao was also an avid reader. Futaro Yamada, Arthur C. Clarke, Tolkien, and even Kurt Vonnegut were foundational influences, teaching a young Shibao how to envision new worlds of his own. Shibao loved literature and cinema, and either one could have become his primary focus in life if it weren't for one major diversion. In high school, Shibao became obsessed with tabletop gaming, specifically with the war simulation games published by SPI and Avalon Hill. But the games were released in English, not Japanese, so in order to play them with his friends, Shibao had to translate all of the rulebooks himself. In the process, he ended up learning a great deal about game design. Looking back on it now, that experience turned out to be a valuable education in two different ways. One, it got me thinking about rules and game mechanics and what makes a game fun, which I found fascinating. The other was that the rule books, uh, particularly of the SPI games, were very well made. And I learned a lot about how to explain rules and mechanics so that they'd be easy for others to understand. 
Throughout his teens, Shibao developed into a stargazer with an adventurous soul. He translated complex board games. He fell in love with science fiction. He got blackout drunk for the first time. And when it came time for college, he embarked on a quest to pursue his creative passions as a lawyer. That wasn't what Shibao intended. He applied to study literature at Waseda University, but he didn't get accepted into that field. Law, his distant second choice, seemed interesting enough in theory. But before long, Shibao found his classwork insufferably dull. He focused his efforts instead on the Waseda Mystery Club, a student group within the college that focused on writing. And in that group, he thrived. Shibao made a number of lifelong friends in the Waseda Mystery Club, as well as crucial business connections to people in the publishing industry. And with his specialty in translating rulebooks, Shibao quickly filled his schedule with freelance work writing strategy guides for video games. By that point, he was only sporadically attending his classes on Japanese law, and he eventually dropped out entirely to focus on his freelance career. Shibao played many, many video games while writing strategy guides, in addition to the games he played out of personal interest. Among the latter, he was particularly fond of a very early JRPG called Poibos. Though it was categorized as an RPG, the game design was done wholly by developers that obviously didn't have any experience playing TRPG or simulation board games, let alone a PC RPG. I suspect the people who made the game read about RPGs in a, in a magazine and imagined what RPGs were like. It's hard for new things to emerge from the standard lexicon that rest at the center of the language. We could say that Poibos is a, a masterpiece that emerged from a frontier dialect. Today, Poibos is about as obscure as a video game can get, and it certainly isn't easy on the eyes. But the fact that Hidenori Shibao cherished the game's unusual and broken frontier dialect speaks to his fascination with the frontiers that he would later explore for himself. Throughout his 20s, Shibao was an extremely prolific writer. He wrote a great volume of guidebooks and more interesting for me, an even greater volume of video game reviews, through which he developed his personal philosophy on game design. He kept that entire decade of work archived on a floppy disk, and the disk broke. The work I did in my 20s is the missing link in my life. Perhaps we can make sense of it by thinking that my embarrassments of the past have been erased by the hand of a merciful God. Well, let's think about it that way. We don't have those reviews or those guidebooks, but thanks to Shibao's blog, we know exactly why they weren't enough to satisfy him. In 1980s Japan, physical guidebooks were highly profitable, and publishing companies churned them out in a system that Shibao compared to factory production. For some guidebooks, Shibao would make an extra creative effort to add flourishes and personality to his work, but that never seemed to matter. Sales were the same high number, whether he put in maximum or minimum effort. Shibao came to believe that his own unique creative voice just didn't matter that much in the factory production world of strategy guides. He wanted more. His first taste of something bigger came when he was assigned to collaborate with a manga artist on a new series. It was a project that never came to fruition for Shibao, but the process of creating a new world from scratch fascinated him and gave him renewed confidence in his own creative skills. Around the same time, he played Final Fantasy III and Makai Toshi Saga, two RPGs which convinced him that video games were the most powerful medium for conveying alien and foreign fantasy worlds. And coincidentally, one of his old friends from Waseda Mystery Club had just started a game development company, specializing in Game Boy titles. The stars had aligned. Shibao and his friend went to Asmagase, a game company where another Waseda Mystery Club alum happened to work, to pitch a bold and original new RPG for the Game Boy. And that pitch was rejected. From a business perspective, the heads of Asmagase weren't interested in making new software for the Game Boy, but they were interested in Nintendo's hot new console, the Super Famicom, and they were also interested in Hidenori Shibao. People often say that an artist's whole self is evident in their first work, and I think that is true with Lennis. There's this Terry Pratchett quote that I love and that I'm about to butcher. 
he said that in the entire fantasy genre, Tolkien looms like a giant mountain. And sometimes J.R.R. Tolkien is big and up close in a work. Sometimes he's just a distant shape on the horizon. And sometimes he's not in a work at all, either because someone is trying very hard to exclude the mountain from the picture, or because they're currently standing on it. The mountain of Tolkien looms over or under the entire fantasy genre. Books, comics, movies. It's true in all forms of fantasy media, and it's especially visible in fantasy video games. In the early 90s, two behemoth franchises dominated the Japanese role-playing game genre, Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. Both franchises drew heavily in structure and content from the tabletop classic Dungeons & Dragons and, by extension, from J.R.R. Tolkien. It's not hard to see the lineage. In the early entries of both franchises, you spend your time battling goblins and wizards, befriending elves and dwarves, acquiring mithril armor. These were well-known tropes, an iconography that was easy for a wide international audience to parse. They were games that painted interesting new pictures with a familiar palette. Linus looked really fucking different. The world of Linus is drenched in kaleidoscopic pastels, riddled with veins, and cluttered with architecture so completely foreign that the only way to tell the difference between a tree and a house is to try and walk inside. It's a visual aesthetic far out on the limb of a much different branch of fantasy lineage, one that draws less from the well of Tolkien and more from the fabulous imaginations of Mobius and René Lalou. With his first game as writer-director, Hidenori Shibao aimed for nothing less than a masterpiece. And the way he saw it, the other two masterpiece franchises had visual aesthetics helmed by master artists. Final Fantasy had Yoshitaka Amano, Dragon Quest had Akira Toriyama. So Asmogace went hunting for an artist to define the look of Linus, and they settled on a team of two, Hiroyuki Kato and Keski Goto. Kato and Goto were not gamers. Neither artist had played a single video game for years when they were hired to illustrate concept art for Linus. Their reference pool didn't include Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. They were much more interested in the aesthetic of surreal French science fiction that inspired them, and Shibao, eager to create a brand new alien world, encouraged those interests. When Kato and Gota worried about how their work would translate into 16-bit graphics, Shibao told them to just ignore the tech and chase their passions to the utmost extremes. The results speak for themselves. Nothing else on the Super Famicom looked like Linus. It looked new, really new and breathtakingly different. That's a huge part of why so many people love it. And that's also why a lot of people hate it. Agonizing doesn't even begin to describe the appearance of Paladin's Quest. Instead of using such time-honored hues as red, green, and blue, the game's artists decided to abandon primary colors in favor of their less popular cousins, cyan, magenta, and teal. Oh, and vomit us yellow, pale brown, mint green, and Pepto-Bismol pink. In both quality and technicality, the graphics of Paladin's Quest are atrocious. Overall score, 1 out of 10. This is not an RP Gamer callout video. Many American critics felt the exact same way when the game was first released here, under the localized title Paladin's Quest. The game got middling scores from reviewers who had grown accustomed to games that looked and felt like Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. To them, the radical aesthetic of Linus was simply wrong, a glitch, a careless mistake. The English language gaming magazines of the day were buyer's guides, more interested in video games as products than as a medium of expression. And yes, that mentality still dominates huge swaths of the discourse today, but in the 90s there were no real alternatives. We didn't have a Jacob Geller or a Dan Olson to turn to. We still don't really have CJ the X, and the minute they do an hour on Zelda, YouTube will end. Fuck, I look like a Zoltar machine. Put it Octorok. In my mouth, I'll spit it back at the moon at the speed of light. That's where the craters come from. No, in the 1990s, we had gaming magazines, and gaming magazines did not understand Linus. They didn't understand how it looked, how it played, or what it was trying to do. Broadly speaking, they didn't really care. 
English-speaking critics typically refer to Paladin's Quest as an RPG made by Enix, a kind of sister game to Dragon Quest. That characterization personally annoyed Hidenori Shibao. After all, Enix was just the game's publisher, not the developer. Enix was always primarily a publisher. The original Dragon Quest games were developed by Chunsoft, but if you only read 90s gaming magazines in the US, you would have had no idea about any of that. Sloppy research was par for the course. The true circumstances of the game's development, the passions that moved and inspired the actual creators, didn't matter at all in a buyer's guide. So far, I've talked a lot about how Linus looks. Now let's talk about what Linus is. Linus grew from the seed of one central idea. A great ancient machine has suddenly gone out of control. Before he developed characters, plot, game systems, or the world of Linus, Shibao started with that core scenario. For Shibao, the scenario and the setting were significantly more important in game design than the characters of the plot. Shibao preferred video games with silent protagonists onto whom the players could project their own personalities. He believed that if players identified themselves as the protagonists and were thrust into a scenario with clear motivation to explore a world full of interesting people and places, then plot and characterization would organically emerge from the resulting experience. So the scenario is the core of Linus. A great ancient machine has suddenly gone out of control. And that's a compelling scenario. But to motivate players even further, Shibao appended that core scenario with one ingenious twist. A great ancient machine has suddenly gone out of control, and you're the one who set it free. Linus begins with Chesney, the player character and a promising young student at a magic academy, being goaded by his classmates into breaking into an off-limits tower near the school. After you break in, you inadvertently unleash an ancient machine, Dalgren, which sunders the school and kills almost everyone inside it before rampaging away into the distance in search of more places to destroy. From that point on, the rest of Linus is about saving the world from the catastrophe that you unleashed. The fact that you're the one responsible for the catastrophe presents a strong motivation to overcome the obstacles on your journey to save the world. And just to reiterate, that journey gets strange. The alien world of Linus is populated by a large number of diverse species, few of which correspond to traditional fantasy species. You have the Skuru, bat-eared flyers who ranch plump purple birds for sustenance. The Ratgorn aren't quite insects or lizards, but they definitely aren't neither of those things. The Fiorla are a little like elves, but also they have armor plating growing out of their foreheads. Oh, and all of those species can interbreed to produce new species. The world of Linus is highly diverse, but that diversity is polarized across the equator. Nasquat to the north and Sasquat to the south are culturally and politically at odds, prone to violent conflict, and that's something you experience firsthand during your journey. Chesney's home is in Nasquat, where your adventure begins. Broadly speaking, the people of Nasquat are friendly and inviting to you. Local businesses are freely available for you to peruse, and townspeople welcome you into their houses. But when you get to Sasquatch, all of that flips. Townspeople gawk and shout, complaining about your stench and your ugliness. Shopkeepers attack you on sight. Until you can find a proper Sasquatch disguise, every single person you meet knows instantly that you're a foreigner. And every single aspect of the gameplay tells you in concrete terms that foreigners are not welcome. It's not just dialogue, not just set dressing. When that shopkeeper attacks you, you actually lose HP. Communicating story through interactive sequences rather than just dialogue is a hallmark of Linus that I deeply appreciate. Just as Shibao intended, the world of Linus is chock full of unique little pavilions I was glad to explore. I led a ramshackle alien parade out through the world map. I fled from brainwashed townspeople, innocent pushovers who I couldn't bear to fight. And when I fell out of step with the flow of time, the visual aesthetic changed radically to accommodate and accentuate the transition. The sense of the alien and the bizarre that defines Linus extends all the way to the systems level, where Shibao encouraged the team to make some radical breaks from established JRPG formulas. 
Notably, combat menus are controlled by the direction buttons instead of the face buttons, a major change that the development team initially pushed back on, but which went on to become a defining feature of Shibao's work. The spellcasting system also broke from genre norms. Most RPGs at the time gave players a pool of magic points that they could spend to cast spells. It's still a common system today, and it was near universal at the time. But in Linus, you have no magic points. You cast spells by spending your health instead, sacrificing more HP for stronger magic. And where most JRPGs allowed you to stock up on ridiculous amounts of healing items, your healing potions in Linus had a finite number of doses, which had to be refilled in towns. Unless, of course, you're in Sasquatch, and then the shopkeeper will just shout at you instead. Taking damage to cast spells was pretty disorienting for players and critics at the time. It's still pretty disorienting today, and with healing options so limited, it's easy to see why Linus developed a reputation among fans as a prickly and unusually difficult game. But for players like me, that disorientation is part of the appeal. Linus doesn't adapt to your expectations. If you want to finish the game, you have to adapt to Linus. So over time, you do. Shibao once told game designer Zach Wood that a central appeal of RPGs for players was the joy of familiarizing themselves with an unknown world as they master a game and get to know characters. Something like turning an alien world into your new hometown. With Linus, Shibao provided that exact joy, at least for me. He created a strange alien world unlike anything I'd ever seen, bracing as a splash of ice-cold water directly to the brain. And then he crafted a path for me to walk along in that alien world. By the end, Linus became a place that I knew and cherished. An alien planet actually did become as familiar to me as my own hometown. That's real alchemy. Linus was an achievement that Shibao was proud of, a game over which he felt he had real creative control. Later in life, he would reflect on the game with pride. Linus has lots of rough spots, and I'd be very embarrassed by some parts of the game now. But when I go back and reread the strategy books and other media from the time, Linus just feels like it was filled with this pure joy I had at being able to make an RPG. For Shibao, joy defined the experience of making Linus. But the long process of creating the sequel was one with much less joy and much more anxiety. Critics didn't understand Linus, and a lot of players didn't either, but it sold well. More than 200,000 copies internationally, and those numbers more than justified a sequel for Asmogase, as long as one could be produced reasonably quickly, before the Super Famicom gave way to the looming 3D console generation. So Shibao and his team came up with a limited, manageable concept they could produce in just two years. Linus 2 took four years to make. Shibao ascribes the protracted development of Linus 2 to a few different root problems. A new programmer whose unskilled work set the team back, a producer who mismanaged that team, and low morale from developers who increasingly doubted the game would actually get released. Shibao's income dwindled to a tiny fraction of what he'd grown accustomed to, placing a severe strain on his home life. He considered it a miracle that Linus 2 got released at all. But thanks to the commitment and perseverance of the development team, Linus 2 survived the delays and made it to store shelves. For Linus 2, Shibao developed a new core scenario, Grand Unification. The various worlds in the game are fragmented, and the children of God seek to reunite those fragments. Unification sounds kind of satisfying at first blush, like clicking together the pieces of a puzzle. But in Shibao's imagination, unification quickly takes on a much darker meaning. In the game's opening, the protagonist, Ferris, wakes up in a bizarre dimension from centuries of deep sleep, to find himself worshipped in a temple built around him by devout followers, who believe he will bring about the Grand Unification. None of those followers know what the Grand Unification actually is, and neither does Ferris, but everybody wants it and you're the guy who's supposed to do it, so you gather the world's relics and fulfill the world's prophecies. Then, when the Unification finally begins,
When it's all over, you find yourself flung into a different world, else. A world where you're no longer a beloved religious icon. You're a nobody, an unknown foreigner in a weird new world. The only thing you do know is that somebody out there in else is working very hard to initiate an even grander unification. With that horrifying prospect for a motivator, Ferris sets out on one of the most unique and memorable adventures I've experienced in a video game. There is so much rich, creative work packed into that cartridge. The original Linus has its fair share of highlights and memorable moments, but the sequel is full to bursting with bizarre interactions and sudden left turns. You travel between planets on a gravity rainbow which plays like an arcade game. You wade through cave water for insect eggs which you need to acquire in order to build a house. You receive a deep tissue massage from the fragments of a disintegrated giant. You can eat edible explosives at a rundown alien pub if you really want to, but I don't recommend ordering any drinks. The leaky urinals are situated directly above the liquor supply. Some of the most effective moments of alien strangeness compound that strangeness by completely inverting JRPG genre norms. For example, one of the first lessons any JRPG teaches you is to talk to every townsperson you meet. Some of them might only say hello, but others will drop hints about the world. They'll mention that the evil king has a debilitating fear of fire, or that the prison warden has a weakness for homemade apple pie. If you're playing a JRPG and you don't know where to go next, you talk to the townspeople. But that genre staple is flipped on its head in Linus 2 when you first arrive in Else. You're immediately stricken with a curse that turns anyone you speak to into a stone statue. You don't know the first thing about this new world. You don't have any information about how to remove the curse. If you've played a lot of JRPGs, your first instinct is to talk to the townspeople to gather information about a cure, but that's exactly what you can't do. It's deeply disorienting, and it emphasizes the hostility and unfamiliarity of Elks in a clever, organic, and memorable way. An appropriate introduction to a section of the game with a dizzying amount of freedom and multiple dangerous paths to tread. Some of my favorite moments in Linus 2 are optional side quests with limited impact on the gameplay. In most JRPGs, side quests reward you with weapons, trinkets, money. But in Elts, sometimes all you get is a thank you. And sometimes you don't even get that. In the thriving market hub of Gloucester, separated from the sprawling impoverished slums to the east by armed border patrols, you'll find a concert hall in disarray. The members of the tiny orchestra have misplaced their instruments, and it's up to you to retrieve them. It's the kind of long-term side quest that would end, in most games, with a rare weapon or a new magic spell. But in Linus 2, the reward for returning the instruments to the orchestra is just listening to the orchestra. Each time you bring back a new instrument, the orchestra performs, first as a solo, then a duet, each instrument fleshing out the composition one by one. The music, and the way it blossoms while you assemble it, is the reward. And by the way, the music in Linus 2, it's good. Kohei Tanaka composed both Linus games. It was a daunting task, a narrow line to walk, to create a strange and alien soundscape befitting Shibao's vision, while also creating music that sounded good. Music that expressed comprehensible emotions and atmospheres without breaking the spell of the bizarre world of the game. Personally, I think the soundtrack of the original Linus could have used a few more truly bizarre bangers in the mix, and I don't think I'm alone. Tanaka released a set of more fully fleshed out compositions unchanged from the SFC soundship's limitations, and I believe these arrangements make it clear that he had aspirations towards a stranger sound.
Linus 2 is still chained to the limitations of a 16-bit console, and there aren't as many gnarly squelches or tinny jangles as I'd like. But on a few tracks, we get to hear Kohei Tanaka flex his skills to produce some inspired sonic strangeness. Maybe I'm an outlier, but if I could have a soundtrack that's just that, that just aims a mallet directly at my brain's funny bone and strikes it with syncopated rhythm, I'd be a happy guy. But even a musical pervert like me has to admit that Kohei Tanaka's more conventional work on the soundtrack is always good, often great, and occasionally sublime. The original Linus took me to an unfamiliar world and taught me how to love even its roughest edges. The same can be said of Linus 2. Returning to the original game's titular setting towards the end of Linus 2 was a welcome surprise, but by then I'd already fallen in love with Elts too. Many players who gave Linus 2 a chance fell under its spell, but this time around there were a lot fewer players to entrance. Asmic Ace wanted to release Linus 2 in 1994. And that was a huge year for the Super Famicom. Super Metroid came out in 1994. Final Fantasy VI came out in 1994. The console was doing great, but Linus 2 took four years to make. It didn't come out in 1994. It came out in 1996, one month after the Nintendo 64 went on sale. Linus 2 was a niche game released on an effectively dead console. There was no effort to localize the game for international release, no transmutation into Paladin's Quest 2. The game only went on sale in Japan, and there it sold poorly. Oh, pause. Observant viewers will notice that the text in this Japanese-only game is written here in English. Let's talk about that for a second. Well, this is the part of the video where I think I might lose some people. My favorite genre in my favorite medium is the Japanese role-playing game, and I don't speak Japanese. For most fans, that's not a deal-breaker. The list of JRPGs with official English translations is long, but that list is also incomplete, and it's incomplete in terrible ways. Localizing any game into a new language takes effort, and in the case of JRPGs, that effort can be monumental. RPGs have vastly more text than most other games, which makes localizing a JRPG particularly expensive. It's an expense which larger companies can afford, but which smaller companies often can't, especially if they don't think their games have broad international appeal. As a result, the JRPGs most likely to get official English translations are the juggernauts, the headliners, the canon. And the games which stay region locked are often the underdogs, the weirdos, the fringe experimental titles. The very games I love the most. And so I'm grateful, truly and profoundly grateful, for the work of fan translators, unpaid enthusiasts who crack code and donate long hours of work to the preservation and the popularization of games that would otherwise remain completely inaccessible to global audiences. Because if we leave fringe games untranslated, if we let monetary success define the shape of video game history, we lose so much color, texture, and charm. We lose vital creative voices and unique perspectives from those outside the mainstream. Every day, fan translators ensure that history isn't lost, proof positive that interactive fiction on the fringes can resonate just as powerfully as, if not more than, the best regarded classics. I want to be clear, I'm not saying that if a game is released only in Japan, it's somehow lost media. It's just that translations make games so much more broadly accessible and thereby increase their cultural footprint. 
So with that in mind, with that sincere gratitude having been expressed, because I do want you to play Linus 2, I also have to acknowledge that the fan translation of Linus 2 has some issues. The sole English fan translation of Linus 2 was produced by Dynamic Designs and helmed by Wild Bill, a translator who has generated minor controversy for inserting his right-wing politics into unrelated translations, most infamously in the translation of Shell Monster Story. In case you haven't already clocked me, I am an anti-police, anti-capitalist radical. The Venn diagram of my politics and Wild Bill's are two circles further apart than the Milky Way and Andromeda. And my politics are not secondary to my identity or to the art I love. They're central. With all that said, I do want to be measured here. There are no explicit political statements or references to real-world politics in the fan translation of Linus 2. The wicked alien overlord Granada does not make any comments about socialized medicine. But the tastes and personal style of Wild Bill do impact the localization, which is not innately bad. Localization is an art form which is always revealing about the tastes and preferences of the translator. Dogmatic one-to-one -one translations often fail miserably to convey tone. But decisions about where and how to convey that tone will always be affected by, and therefore evidence of, the attitudes of the human being doing the translating. So I don't consider it an implicit criticism when I mention that Dynamic Designs added their own flavor and style to the translation, nor do I think they modify the text in a way that's consistently distracting. This is not some rancid working designs translation from the late 90s. At the worst, it's got the wacky energy of Final Fantasy 2-4. But there are notable moments where Wild Bill's presence is felt in the English text in a way that I find disappointing, particularly in dialogue with female characters in the game. There are more than a few instances where a woman will break character to make overt sexual advances at the protagonist. And from what comparisons I've been able to manage with the original Japanese text, these moments generally seem unique to the dynamic design's localization. Unlike some other gently fumbled attempts to inject humor into the dialogue, these changes to dialogue with women in Linus 2 are distracting in the worst way. Individually, they feel awkward and stilted. Taken as a whole, they reduce women in the game from rich, unique characters down to prizes to be won. It's a series of very visible changes that significantly weaken the experience of the game in the only English language version available. So, that's my take. But it is not the final word on the subject, far from it. Hidenori Shibao was fully aware of the fan translation, and he loved it. They did an incredible job. The, the game actually had some serious bugs, ones that could stop you from proceeding through the game, and, and they actually fixed them. Officially, of course, we can't recognize or legally approve of this sort of thing, but personally, I was hoping that someone would do it. Translating from such disparate languages as Japanese and English enriches a cultural understanding, which is something I very much want to see. Hidenori Shibao's first education in games was the fan translation of English tabletop games for his friends. He knew more than most about the joys and struggles of that process. And when asked about Dynamic Design's fan translating his criminally underappreciated game, he was enthusiastically supportive and grateful. And yes, I'm grateful too. I couldn't have played Linus 2 without the Dynamic Design's translation. I know because I tried. I used a machine translation program to try to parse the game for myself, and while I have no doubt that such apps can increase accessibility for many games, a text-rich and cerebrally written game like Linus 2 flies far above what algorithms can currently accomplish. So I'm grateful and frustrated simultaneously. Dynamic Designs worked for years without compensation on Linus 2, and without their hard work, I wouldn't have been able to experience it for myself. At the same time, they made changes to the text which I believe damaged the overall experience in ways I'm not comfortable writing off as trivial. <laughs> Real life is fucking messy. But whatever I think about the fan translation, it's not hard to see why Shibao would have felt especially grateful. It's the most he could hope for. Released two years late on a dying console, Linus 2 was never going to get an official English translation. As a Japanese regional exclusive, 
the game moved just over 10,000 units, a tiny fraction of its predecessor sales. For the business folks at Asmagase, the word Linus was toxic. No further money would be spent on Linus 2, and there was absolutely no chance for a third Linus game. That was devastating news for Shibao. He had always envisioned the Linus games as a trilogy, and he had deliberately left huge mysteries unsolved in the first two games so that he could bring them to a satisfying conclusion in Linus 3, a conclusion now permanently cancelled. Fans would ask Shibao about Linus 3 for the rest of his life, and while he shared bits of information from time to time and eventually wrote a prequel novel, he was reluctant to describe in words what was meant to be experienced in an interactive medium. In Shibao's mind, the Linus games would be forever incomplete. In the wake of that disappointment, he decided that his next game wouldn't be part of a series. He wouldn't take that risk again. With his next game, Shibao decided that he would tell a complete and self-contained story. The core concept of Linus was a great ancient machine going out of control. The core concept of Linus 2 was a grand and disastrous unification. For Legend of Ligaia, Shibao also started with a core concept, a seed idea from which a grand adventure was born, a dead, ruined world covered in fog. Shibao's lifelong love of science fiction had informed the Linus games, but here he pulled from his love of horror instead. Building out his core concept, Shibao remembered the otherworldly monsters lurking in Stephen King's Mist, the grotesque body horror of John Carpenter. And deep in the throes of a fixation on Roman history, Shibao grappled with the horrors of war and militarism. He believed that a world already ruined by such horrors would present a stronger motivation for players, not a quest to save a peaceful world from a villain bent on global destruction, but a quest to restore a world already blighted by that destruction. The world at the beginning of Ligaia is a world where the villains have already won, where hope and light must be clawed back acre by painstaking acre. And it occurred to Shibao how powerful it would feel for players to paint their quest on the very face of the world, to walk across a land once enshrouded by fog, but by their own actions restored. I wanted to make something that felt like taking an eraser to a dirty canvas in order to expose the, the beautiful painting underneath. I really like that the things you accomplish are engraved on the ground you walk upon. Ligaya departs from Shibao's previous work in many ways. There's the obvious, the change in console, the change from 2D to 3D, the replacement of sorcery with martial arts, and the change from science fiction to fantasy and horror. But some of the biggest changes happened behind the scenes. Ligaia was a product of very different circumstances than the Linus games. With no prospects for a new game at Asmic Ace, Shibao worked instead with Contrail, an internal development house for Sony. In that new environment, he was no longer a writer-director with sweeping creative control. He didn't have his longtime collaborators on hand. Kato and Goto weren't brought in for illustration, and Kohei Tanaka wasn't the game's composer. Hidenori Shibao wrote Ligaya, and the game is defined in large part by his creative vision, but he didn't direct the game, and he found himself fighting against business interests that ran directly counter to his game design philosophy. When it came to Legend of Ligaya, we had a big fight about this. Do you know how there's signs in front of say an inn, right? Japanese and English don't exist in Ligaya. I wanted the sign to show a bed, or a moon, or a lamp or something. The staff just wrote in on a sign in English letters. I fought hard to get that changed, and to this day, I wish I'd put my foot down. That may seem like a small dispute, a spat over the signage of fictional ends, but as one of many such disputes, it's representative of a much larger conflict that defined the development of Ligaya. 
Shibao wanted the world of Ligaya to feel distinct, strange, and radically unfamiliar, a goal which was completely at odds with what Sony's representatives wanted out of the game. According to Shibao, the business people at the top of the chain wanted a game that would conform to player expectations. The conventional fantasy game that Sony wanted and the strange, unfamiliar Ligaya Shibao designed were in deep tension with each other all the way through to the game's release. To stay on trend, higher-ups wanted characters in Ligaya to be designed with big moe cartoon eyes and to shout out catchphrases during battle. Shibao resented both dictates, and whenever he played the game himself, he'd always use the debug menu to turn off battle voices. Shibao lost those arguments, but he won a few too. For instance, there was a popular trope in JRPGs of the era where an ally of the party would suddenly and unexpectedly betray the player. And I'm using the term unexpected very generously. This world is imperfect. What? If only I could wipe away the impurities. Is anybody else listening to and this? make it as beautiful as me. In Legend of Ligaya, there is no sudden betrayal. Characters in your party sometimes argue and disagree, but they ultimately manage to come together and resolve their differences. Even the game's antagonists remain true to their own warped ideals. That consistency was important to Shibao, and despite pressures to the contrary, it's an argument he managed to win. He also won the argument about the mist itself. In development terms, Legend of Ligaya's mist was a double-edged sword. Implementing the fog was a technical hurdle for the 32-bit PlayStation. But, on the other hand, the mist meant that every town map could pull double duty as a dungeon map. Even the higher-ups could see the value in that. In some instances, Shibao felt personally betrayed by those higher-ups. In his journal, he recalled an incident during development when his father experienced a sudden health emergency. Shibao left work to be with his family, but while he was at the hospital, major changes were made to the game without consulting him. Changes that higher-ups knew he vehemently opposed. There is no possible way for me to confirm that anecdote or its implications. We only have one side of the story and there is no hard evidence. I'm not telling you this story to impugn the characters of anyone working at Contrail, Procyon, or Sony. I'm including the anecdote because I think it speaks to Hidenori Shibao's personal investment in his own creative vision for Ligaya. Accurately or not, he felt that forces behind the scenes were conspiring against his vision, even to the point of exploiting his father's illness, fully aware that he would have fought against those decisions tooth and nail if he'd been there in the office. To Hidenori Shibao, these game design questions were not minor disputes. He took them very seriously, regretting some of the arguments he lost for the rest of his life. Although Shibao ended up making lifelong friends during the development of Ligaya, it was a troubled time for him. By all accounts, including his own, Shibao was a man of strong opinions, and the frequent arguments about Ligaya's creative direction clearly took a toll on him. Even differences in lifestyle contributed to his feeling of alienation. The development offices had a non-smoking policy, so Shibao, a chain smoker, had to have a special air purifier installed in his personal office to accommodate his habit. He also began to feel generational differences with the staff developing the game. Considering Shibao's natural social exuberance, his extroversion, the way he loved to party into the early morning with friends, acquaintances, and strangers of all backgrounds, his isolation during development speaks to the deep-rooted nature of his conflict with the business interests trying to shape Ligaya. Ligaya. You've heard me shorten the title that way over and over in this video, and if I'm being honest, that's a habit that I've deliberately cultivated, because the legend part of Legend of Ligaya is yet another battle that Shibao lost. Putting the word legend in the title of your JRPG in the 90s was a sound marketing decision. It told the consumer at a glance that your game was a fantasy JRPG, the same way putting the word revenge in your movie title tells everybody it's a sequel, or putting the word pounded in your book title tells me that you're Chuck Tingle. But Shibao objected to putting legend in the title because legend and prophecy were two storytelling tropes he'd been working for years to deconstruct and critique. You can see the origins of this critique in Linus 2. The protagonist begins the game at the mercy of a grand prophecy which nobody actually understands. Even though Ferris' followers don't know what the prophecy means, they build temples in its honor and celebrate its fulfillment, right up until the prophecy gets them all killed. In Ligaya, Shibao expanded on those ideas. The game's introductory text spins legends about God and the origins of the apocalyptic fog enshrouding the world. 
legends which are eventually demystified by the player's first-hand experiences. The only true prophecies in the game are spoken by the living prophets who first perceived them, and those are prophecies of potential rather than determinism. It was important to Shibao that the world of Lagaya was a world of the present, a world where the players felt that they were writing the fate of the world for themselves rather than simply following instruction manuals written by long-dead ancestors. Shibao didn't want the word legend in the title, but that's an argument he lost, one of many. So after all of the arguments, all of the tension, all of the clashing between bold creativity and genre conventions, what do we have? What is the game? What is Legend of Lagaya? Vaughn is a stoic, blue-haired youth living in one of the last little pockets of human civilization left on the planet, a coastal hamlet called Rim Elm, protected by a giant stone wall from the outside world. Beyond that stone wall, the world is covered in a terrible mist teeming with monsters. Those monsters were once boons to the human race. Known as Saru, they were creatures that could bond symbiotically with the human body to grant superhuman strength, speed, and even flight. But the mysterious mist that covers the world drives any Saru that touches it into violent madness. Even worse, the mist degenerates any human physically bonded with the Saru into the same nightmarish state, dominated by an endless and unquenchable bloodthirst. Life inside Rim Elm is peaceful but precarious. Every adult male is conscripted to hunt for food outside the walls, a dangerous job that either breaks or kills most men by middle age. The prospects for long-term survival are dwindling, and village elders fear that Rim Elm is doomed to wither away. The game begins on the eve of Vaughn's first day as a hunter, but that day never comes. Late at night, a giant Saru beast reduces Rim Elm's great stone wall to rubble, and the mist and the Saru come pouring in. By the way, if you are feeling some very familiar overtones right now, you're not alone. It's super interesting, but let's call it a topic for another day. As chaos descends upon Rim Elm, Vaughn fights his way to the center of town, a plaza dedicated to a decrepit old tree where the mist won't seem to go and where a strange voice is calling his name. Vaughn discovers a Saru inside the tree, a special kind of Saru that's immune to the effects of the mist, and with that Saru's mysterious power, he breathes life into the Genesis tree and banishes the mist from Rim Elm. From that point on, Vaughn's quest is clear and straightforward. With his special raw Saru to protect him, Vaughn can travel through the mist with other raw Saru wielders and seek out the other Genesis trees, ridding the world of mist one small region at a time. But remember, this is still a Hidenori Shibao game. Your quest doesn't stay straightforward for long. In the deepest recesses of the mist, you find generators belching out great volumes of the stuff and you destroy them, which inexplicably saddens your raw Saru. You meet other Saru wielders who seem immune to the mist, but who are nevertheless warped and vicious versions of their former selves. Your heroic actions have tragic consequences. Saving some parts of the world condemns others to destruction. The world is much stranger than it initially seems, something you see for yourself as you travel through time, through dimensions, and through dreams. And just when you think your journey is finally finished, when it seems that the world has finally been saved, your hometown of Rim Elm is lost. Hidenori Shibao wanted strange worlds to become like new hometowns, but in the final act of Lagaya, your hometown is warped back into the strange. Rim Elm is absorbed into the body of the same monstrous Saru that once tore down its walls. Here, the game's horror reaches its absolute zenith. To save your home, you have to pass through the Juggernaut's maw and journey through its pulsing innards down to its corrupted heart. Along the way, you pass your suffering friends and family fused into the beast's flesh, begging to be rescued. And... And I played that part of the game at my grandfather's house. A world as strange to me as the one pulsing past the Juggernaut's maw. It looked and smelled like old people, like the nursing homes we'd occasionally visit, 
except now we lived in one. My grandfather made orange Juliuses for us. He loved them and he made them from scratch. One time I found a bucket of chicken blood in his pantry. The road from his house to my elementary school had a big dip in it, and my father would pretend that was a roller coaster. And when I got home from school, I journeyed through the intestines of the juggernaut, battling demonic beasts to save the people of Rim Elm. I can't do it. I can't separate the two experiences. The twanging of the bizarre soundtrack, the weird imp Saru with their card-based spell attacks, chicken blood, sickly sweet orange slush saving the world. The neurons are all clumped together. I love the music Michiru Oshima wrote for the game. I listen to it often. I love her other work too. Her collaborations on the eco score were groundbreaking and gorgeous. But would the score of Legend of Ligaya move me quite so deeply if it hadn't been the soundtrack to my first grand adventure in a JRPG? I truly can't say. I want desperately to convince you that independent from my particular lived experiences, Legend of Ligaya is an excellent game worth playing. But I can't meaningfully talk about the game without acknowledging how specifically I played it. What I can do, I think, is outline some of what I didn't notice the first time I played the game. Because when I replay Legend of Ligaya, I'm not doing it to feel like it's 1999 again. I am very happy that it is not currently 1999. I play the game to engage with its characters and its story, and the way that I play Ligaya has changed over time as my own interests have changed and evolved. For example, have you ever heard of Satan? When I was eight years old, I had never read Paradise Lost. I know, it's embarrassing. Milton's Paradise Lost is a work that looms so large in what people call the Western canon that I can't sum it up in a way that's both satisfying and succinct. But one of the narratives Milton cemented in the Western canon is the narrative of Satan's fall from grace. Arguably, he accidentally portrayed Satan as a very sympathetic character. Topic for another video. I was reading Paradise Lost when I played Legend of Ligaya the third time. Hidenori Shibao never mentioned Milton in his writing, but Milton's broadly influential version of Satan is very much alive in the world of Ligaya. And realizing that fact recontextualized the entire game for me. Late in Ligaya, you travel through the alien world of the Saru, a multifaceted and complex dimension beyond human comprehension, to a place called Rogue's Tower. Like the Saru that Vaughn and his friends wear, Rogue was a raw Saru, a member of the upper echelon of their kind. But Rogue betrayed the other raw Saru and staged a failed rebellion against the god of the Saru world. Rogue was ultimately banished, and from that place of banishment, they granted knowledge of the mist to humanity in order to corrupt the human world. If you're feeling some familiar overtones, you're not alone, and that's a topic for right now. Mapping the narrative of Paradise Lost onto Ligaya reveals a fascinating new reading of the game. If we read Rogue as Satan, then we read the Rasaru as archangels, granting wisdom and protection to their chosen human hosts. And if we read the Rasaru as archangels, then when the Rasaru reveal what they're really fighting for, a world in which neither Saru nor Rasaru can interact directly with humans, we have a fascinating new context in which to place that vision of the future. Hidenori Shibao never mentioned Milton in his writing, but he did mention spirituality and ancient storytelling tropes. He mentioned them in the context of Ligaya. He even mentioned them in the context of Rim Elm specifically, where he likened the wall between Rim Elm and the Mist to the Buddhist iconography of Higan, recasting iconography of a demonic beast breaking the wall in the context of a much older spiritual tradition. Let's call it a topic for another day. He was conscious of the limitations of the medium and the genre, but he still made a concerted effort to add depth and nuance to the story. Shibao thought deeply and cared deeply about the world he built for Ligaya, and as a result of that care and effort, he built a world that welcomes analysis from a broad variety of perspectives. The game certainly welcomes attention from horror enthusiasts, perhaps even more so today. 
Modern indie developers have embraced the blocky 32-bit era's polygons as a shorthand for horror and the grotesque. I'm ancient enough to remember when that aesthetic looked like the future, but I thoroughly enjoy the way younger creatives utilize it to represent a warped and disturbing past. And if that's an aesthetic that you like exploring, Ligaya is a rich vein of polygonal horror to mine. Ligaya is also a game with a lot to say about war. When I was eight years old playing Ligaya at my grandfather's house, I didn't have much of a perspective on war. I knew it was bad, but I also suspected it was secretly a lot of fun based on all the movies. Overall, it wasn't something I thought much about. Then the odds happened, and I was suddenly thinking about war a lot. I was reading history, reading philosophy, engaged in cultural conversations about the true functions that war serves in the world. And when Shi Bao wrote Ligaya, he was reading Roman history and engaging with some of those same questions. So as an adult, when I play Ligaya, I can very clearly see him working through the complicated feelings raised by those questions. When they tempted the human world with the corrupting mist, Rogue knew just how to pitch it. Two of Ligaya's great civilizations, Sol and Conquerum, were locked in a perpetual state of war. A war that defined their respective cultures and their sense of national unity and identity. So when Rogue offered the mist to Conquerum's royal scientists, they offered it as a weapon, a super weapon that could defeat Sol. How do you sell the end of the world? Easy. You put a flag on it. Conquerum's royalty took the bait. They manufactured the literal substance of the world's ruin themselves, flooding the entire world with mist. The war did end soon after, but not the way Conquerum's royalty imagined. Sol, towering high above the ground, was no longer a military force with imperial aspirations. It was an island surrounded by death and misery with a bird's eye view over a world with no hope and no future. The people of Seoul lived lives of empty, shallow pleasure, all their grand dreams reduced to ashes. When you meet the king of Seoul, he begs you to keep his whereabouts secret, fearful of what his once patriotic subjects might do to him should they find him. As wretched as Seoul fared, Conkrum fared even worse. The royal scientists had manufactured an artificial Saru that could thrive in the mist, and it did. The experimental Saru gorged itself on the capital's veritable geyser of mist, expanding out of control until it had bonded with every human being in the capital. Those people suffered more than a decade of hell, racked with constant agony in changed, ruined bodies fused through the skin with a terrible monster. You go there in the game, you see the people suffering, and you can even talk to them. When I was a kid, no one townsperson really stood out to me. I was just really scared. But as an adult, one of those townspeople seared himself into my brain. Some of the people you talk to in Conkrum beg for relief or for death. Most of them just moan and wail. But one of the people asks you a question. The people of Conkrum have been suffering without relief for years, a fate worse than death. They've been stripped by their suffering to their basest and most raw natures. And this man, stripped down to his core, only has one sentient thought, a single question. He wants to know if Conkrum, the kingdom of endless suffering that brought the entire world to ruin, has won the war against Seoul. Sometimes, when I'm trying to sleep, I remember that character. And then I get out of bed and try and put the thought out of mind, distract myself. What else can I do? I've engaged with Lagaya repeatedly throughout my life, and each time I found that engagement amply rewarded. Hidenori Shibao poured everything he had into the game, and the result is a rich, unique experience that rewards careful attention. But it's not the game that Shibao wanted to make. Not exactly. With Linus and Linus 2, he had something approaching complete creative control. But making Lagaya, his passion and vision were mitigated by business interests that didn't trust Shibao to turn a profit. 
It's a bizarre game about mineral archangels where the heroes shout anime catchphrases during battle. When your ally Noah confronts the excruciating horrors of war, she cries with huge moe eyes. A product of the battles waged by its authors, Legend of Ligaya is a game in deep tension with itself. But as it happens, I think the tension between Shibao and Sony makes Legend of Ligaya the perfect introduction to the weirder, more surreal fringes of the genre. At age 32, I'm the kind of person who loves hostile game experiences, games that are willing to hurt me, shock me, and utterly bewilder me. But at age eight, I think I needed an introduction to that world that I could actually parse. A game with one foot planted firmly in the world of the conventional, and another leg stretched out over a bizarre and dangerous abyss. The shouted catchphrases and cute eyes and genre tropes all felt familiar to me, like cartoons I'd already seen. But the divine mysteries and the body horror and the alien aesthetics all afforded me stray glances into a world of the magnificent unknown that I could someday dive into, a frontier which I might later explore for myself. I don't think Shibao intended Ligaya to be my introduction to the surreal and the bizarre. In fact, I know he didn't. He wrote often about his game design philosophy, and he made it clear that he designed his games with himself in mind, not some imaginary player. I was not on his mind. He didn't intend Ligaya to be my introduction to a strange new world. But it was. It set expectations for me, and it opened my eyes to new possibilities. For once, I will cut straight to the chase. Hidonori Shibao never again had sweeping creative control over a finished video game. That might surprise some people, considering Legend of Ligaya got a direct sequel on the PlayStation 2. But citing the contentious working relationship during Ligaya's development, the heads at Procyon booted Shibao from the sequel entirely. The distinctive arrow button martial arts combat system returned for the sequel, and the game's protagonist looks kind of like Vaughn from far enough away, but the similarities end there. Set in an entirely different world and written without any of Shibao's love for the alien and the bizarre, Ligaya 2 is a game without mist, without mineral angels, and without the kind of innately compelling scenario that adds propulsion to games written by Hidenori Shibao. Perhaps understandably, Shibao was unimpressed. Lagaya 2 isn't really much of a sequel. The developers never understood the world of Lagaya to begin with. The idea of a world isolated by mist was a novel and interesting concept at the time. But nearly all of that is gone in the sequel. Just turned into a sort of fighting game RPG. It doesn't have anything to do with my Lagaya at all, so it's hard for me to see it as a sequel and not just a knockoff that uses the same branding. The game has its fans and defenders. Some of them are probably watching this video right now. Hi. Personally, I do think the game has some charms of its own, but I also think it is a dramatically weaker game than its predecessor. Stung by the Procyon snub, Shibao went on to consult for another JRPG as part of a writing team. This time, he was writing for a new title in the Metal Max franchise, a Dreamcast game called Metal Max Wild Eyes. If you're one of the 12 Metal Max fans outside of Japan, you already know how this story ends. The Metal Max series is fairly popular within Japan, blending the JRPG genre with a Mad Max-styled post-apocalyptic setting, swapping out dragons for tanks. Since the beginning, the series emphasized player freedom rather than linear storytelling and the developers hoped to make Wild Eyes the most freeform entry yet, anchored by a compelling love story. Shibao was one of four scenario writers for the game. He wouldn't get to build a new world from scratch, not in such a firmly established franchise, but he would still get to show off his creative flair and unique voice. It was a project about which he felt very excited, but the game was canceled. Publisher ASCII Entertainment got cold feet about the Dreamcast's tepid sales and reception, and although the game was decently far along in the development process, the plug got unceremoniously pulled. 
You'll find claims online that 2018's Metal Max Xeno was directly based on Wild Eyes, but those claims are speciously sourced. Some marketing suggests Wild Eyes partially inspired the later game, but even that doesn't bear much scrutiny when comparing the finished Xeno with what little we know about Wild Eyes. For all intents and purposes, Wild Eyes is an unreleased game that none of us will ever get to play. There's this awful little anecdote that really stuck out to me when I was reading Shibao's blog. Earlier that same year, Shibao's mother read in the news that Mother 3 for the Nintendo 64 was getting cancelled, and she mistakenly thought that that was the entitled game for which her son was writing. She called him up in a panic, thinking, oh my god, are you okay? And he had to explain, no mom, it's fine, the game that I'm writing for is Metal Max, and it hasn't been cancelled. And then, a few months later, it was. Based on his writing at the time, it's clear that Shibao felt his prospects for full creative control over a brand new game dwindling. On the whole, it seems like there are fewer games for niche gamers. It's almost like the industry has peaked and now exists in some sort of wasteland. Instead of creating a new game he could call his own, Shibao continued to work as a collaborator on other people's creative visions. For example, he got a chance to play around some more in the horror genre in the tremendously bizarre and utterly obscure FMV J-pop idol survival horror adventure game, The Fear. Wait, what's happening? <gasps> she fucking exploded? <laughs> This game just became like a thousand times more awesome. <laughs> as much fun as he had with the fear, Shibao was primarily tasked with adding a semblance of structure to the game director's pre-existing premise, and the work didn't last long. Shibao's most consistent long-term project was working on the Momotaro Dentetsu series. Once again, if you don't live in Japan, you probably have never heard of those games. But on the off chance you have, you already know why it's so poetic that Shibao, of all people, wound up working on them. They're virtual board games. It was a strange sort of return for Shibao in more ways than one. Although he took on a directorial role, similarly to the board games from his teenage years, the Momotaro Dentetsu series wasn't really his. The style and voice of Momotaro Dentetsu belonged to the series creator, Akira Sakuma, and Shibao went out of his way to conform to the pre-existing style that Sakuma had established. In a different sort of way, he was once again translating. By his own accounts, Shibao had a blast working on the series. He especially enjoyed playtesting the games with his wide and ever-growing circle of friends. But they weren't his games. Not the way Linus was his game. And as the years went on, he felt his chances of working on a game he could truly call his own grow more and more remote. Right now, smartphone games are very popular. It's all about keeping customers playing, getting them to put in as much money as possible. Console games have been on a very different path. Should we be adding social features and using their monetization models? Personally? I love traditional console games, and that's what I want to play, but realistically, it isn't practical to make something like that nowadays. And even if he could have gotten a game made during this period, Shibao wasn't sure there would be an audience for the kind of bold and original work he was most interested in making. Instead of learning about unknown worlds and characters, I feel like modern players would rather roam familiar worlds or hang out with friends of friends. I think that the reason Japanese games aren't innovating is that so few players are seeking something new. Instead, they're interested in games that follow the same model, with a different texture. A part of me resists that quote. There are lots of people like me, people that want strange new experiences more than they want the familiar. Somebody made Inscription. Somebody made Immortality. But then, reality hits. Last year's best-selling games in the U.S. were sequels, sequels, cross-branded tentpole sequels, sequels to reboots, Elden Ring, and sequels. I wasn't alive when Hidenori Shibao first got into video games. 
I can't speak to the tastes that defined that era, but I'm living in the very era of familiar franchises and remakes that Shibao anticipated. And in my dark heart of hearts, I know that given the choice between a brand new Hidenori Shibao game and an HD remaster of Legend of Ligaya, the industry and the market we have today would choose the remaster every single time. At first glance, the science fiction worlds of Linus and Elts bear little resemblance to the fantasy world of Ligaya. And it's true that Shibao's ability to make the Ligaya he originally envisioned was heavily mitigated by the circumstances of the game's development. Still, after playing all three games in sequence, clear patterns emerge, preoccupations and iconography that I like to think of as Shibao's personal signature. First and foremost, the dude loved gondolas. Extended gondola lift travel sequences appear in all three games, powered by Forgotten Tech in the Linus games and by Overgrown Saru in Ligaya. Solving the logistical problems of futuristic transit is a recurring fixation in science fiction, like Arthur C. Clarke's Fountains of Paradise, which Shibao often cited as a primary influence. But gondola lifts were also a celebrated means of traveling around the pavilions at Expo 70, and I find it wonderful that we can use them today to travel between the pavilions that Shibao designed for us. Shibao was also smitten with performance arts of all kinds, from fine opera houses to sparsely attended underground burlesque venues, and extended stage performances appear throughout his work. Linus 2 features a full theatrical presentation celebrating Elts' political leader, Potentate Petro, while also revealing his surprising identity to attentive players. Ligaya's primary stage show is a more low-brow affair, a side quest in which your stoic ally Gala is reluctantly recruited to play the straight man in a comedy show. Well, technically, the disco minigame is also performed on a stage. But a much more intimate performance concept also recurs in Shibao's work. In the original Linus, a depressed bar patron is unwilling to help you save his town from destruction. Motivating him to act requires you to convince the bar's piano player to play a specific wistful song. This same basic premise returns in Ligaya, where it's the climax of a more fleshed out side story, reuniting the game's tragic lovers, Kara and Grantes. Grantes himself is a recurring character concept, according to Shibao, a flying man who carries the protagonist to a remote village of other winged people. The wings in Ligaya are technically bonded Saru rather than the natural body parts of an alien species, but many bonded human Saru pairs bear stylistic similarities to alien species in the Linus games. Shibao's wide roster of alien mercenaries for hire in the Linus games gave him opportunities for some very mischievous design choices, like surprising the player with unusually selfish allies. In Linus 2, if you hire Bai in Nigel's slums, the next time you sleep at an inn, he'll abscond with your money. There's also a similar mercenary in the original Linus. And although you can't hire any tricksters to fight for you in Ligaya, Shibao snuck mischief into the game in other ways like tossing in a random super-powered bee attack in Vaughn's hometown just to mess with players. In both these painful little surprises and in the painful ways he subverts genre norms, Shibao developed a reputation for messing with his players. Good people die, and there are two sides to every tale. Things like that really feel like something from Eden no Rishibao. You're absolutely right. I'm the type of game designer that likes to mess with players. It brings me a joy as a game maker to hear you make such a fine point. Seriously, if you're playing a game written by Hidenori Shibao, stay on your guard. Some of Shibao's stylistic hallmarks are more about function than form. Obviously, the arrow key input system remains distinct, but granular elements of his writing reflected his game design philosophy too. Familiar as he was with the medium, he tailored his writing to the dialogue boxes in his games, making sure that each dialogue box contained one central idea. He also liked to weave choices into dialogue, even small ones, both to let players embody the protagonist and as a means of demonstrating to programmers that he was keeping them in mind too. These dialogue trees were often put to use in the form of playful quizzes for the player. 
In Ligaya and the original Linus, sagely female mentor figures quiz the protagonist to make sure he's ready for his quest. The idea has a totally different spin in Linus 2, where the player can take part in a kind of quiz show for fabulous prizes. Some recurring plot devices seem to hold particular interest for Shibao. For example, in all three games, a small hamlet is threatened by earthquakes and natural disasters caused by a monster raging deep underground. All three games also see you journeying through the disgusting innards of a gigantic beast. And then there's the matter of time travel, which occurs by means technological in Linus and means fantastical in Ligaya. Both plot beats are very memorable for different reasons. In Linus, traveling backwards in time strips the game of its defining pastel color palette plunging you into a startling monochrome world. And in Lagaya, it's through time travel that the player gets to fact-check the stories they've been told about the mist, a powerful opportunity for Shibao to challenge legend and prophecy as storytelling contrivances. By my estimation, the most charming tradition in Shibao's work is ending each game with a relaxed, playable epilogue. Shibao always gave players an opportunity to reflect on the story of the game at its conclusion, while still moving through the fictional space. He liked to think of it as a chance to give players a kind of souvenir. Movies, games, books, the best thing that these things we call entertainment can do is to let the audience enjoy themselves while they experience it, and then leave a little trace in their minds once the experience is over. Care was taken to honor player choices in each one of the game's epilogues. The epilogues for Linus and Linus 2 are populated not just with story characters, but with the specific allies the player chose to add to their party throughout the game, making each ending feel specific to an individual player's experience. And although your party is a fixed team of three in Lagaya, the epilogue begins with a choice about what the player wants Fawn to do next. Whether that's pursuing a romantic relationship, training to get stronger, or just traveling the world again. A part of me played the epilogues of Linus and Linus 2 analytically. I, I can't help it. I'm a video essayist and I was marking down game design techniques. But I still vividly remember the pure gut experience from my first playthrough of Lagaya as a kid. Leading up to the ending of Lagaya, I felt really sad. Not about the plot specifically, just the fact that the game was ending. And so I felt relieved when the game let me choose what Vaughn was going to do next. It gave me the license to imagine that leg of the journey for myself, for the game to keep going in my head as long as I wanted it to. That's a hell of a souvenir. One quick editorial note. I did not put a content warning for suicide at the top of the video because I thought it would be misleading because it does not apply to Hidenori Shibao himself. But I am going to be discussing briefly a death by suicide at this part of the video and I just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, if you are currently struggling with that, there are going to be some links and resources in the description. Hidenori Shibao poured everything he could into his games. All of his wild dreams and passions there jammed into the cartridges and burned onto the discs. But a discussion of Hidenori Shibao the writer would be woefully incomplete without some discussion of Hidenori Shibao the man. I read years of this man's diary entries, just reams and reams of journal entries, and I got to talk to some people that knew him personally. I never got to meet him myself. I wasn't that lucky, but I'm gonna do my best. What makes his period of isolation during Lugaya's development so striking is that 99% of the time, Hidenori Shibao was the living incarnation of extroversion and the adventurous spirit. He loved to travel to new places, to drink and debauch with new people until sunrise. And often, those new people stuck around because Shibao made the effort to keep them around. By his own account and the accounts of others, Shibao was deeply opinionated, which could obviously be a source of friction in his life. But although that friction damaged his relationship with Prokeon, other people in Shibao's life learned to love that side of him too, charmed by the impassioned speeches he often gave while he was drinking. He could certainly be impulsive. Shibao once wrote that he had a bad habit of falling in love with women at first sight. In several blog entries, despite suffering from head colds or stomach bugs, he described going out drinking until sunrise on a whim. 
At the height of the mad cow disease scare, he decided to order a steak, just because. But while Shibao was certainly prone to whims, he planned his grandest adventures carefully. Thanks to his adventurous spirit, his website was often a kind of proto-travel blog covering his trips around the world with lavish descriptions of every meal he tasted. After Lord of the Rings came out, which Hidenori Shibao loved, he wanted to go see New Zealand for himself, so he did. And while he was there, he was on a train, and he had his headphones in listening to Howard Shore's epic soundtrack to Lord of the Rings. And right when the score hit this huge crescendo, the train scared a giant group of sheep who ran away in a panic to the sounds of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Hidenori Shibao just burst out laughing in the middle of the train. I liked reading his diary very much. For all the joy and adventure Shibao packed into his life, it wasn't a life without troubles, traumas, and regrets. He was reluctant to discuss the matter at length, but his divorce was a source of real pain for Shibao, and he never remarried. He also suffered from a fear of death that would keep him awake at night, a fear that began in early childhood. One of the great tragedies of Shibao's life was his younger brother's death by suicide, a tragedy that occurred in the midst of the already trying development of Linus II. The death came as a complete shock. For the rest of Shibao's life, he would regularly visit the place where his younger brother died, the Sea of Trees, Aokigahara, as a kind of tribute. According to Shibao, in a small way, the bright, rebellious children you meet in Linus II are also tributes to his brother. Just as the voice of the Rosaru guardian Terra in Legend of Lagaya was inspired by Shibao's grandmother, who passed away during that game's development. Shibao wrote in the past tense about those tragedies. They happened before 1998 when he started his blog after the release of Legend of Lagaya. But he wrote in the present tense about another terrible loss. In his mid-30s, Shibao lost his father. I remember so many days with my father. When I was in elementary school, he'd ride around in his used VW Beetle during the holidays. We went all over the place. The Chugoku Expressway wasn't around at that time. We had to drive all night on country roads to get to the 1970 Osaka World Expo. I even remember my parents arguing in the car. My father's shoes and cane by the front door. His favorite books on the bookshelf. Signs of my father everywhere. There were some people I had to call, and my mother gave me my father's sharp digital notepad. It's the old kind with the four-line display. I went with my father to buy it. When he first had it, he'd have me type for him every time I came home. It looks like he took good care of it. The buttons are wrapped in plastic that was put there by my father's hands. I know firsthand the experience of losing your father in your 30s. And it's something that I didn't know Shibao had experienced himself until it popped up organically while I was reading his blog. Playing Shibao's games helped me better understand him as a writer and a creator, but reading how he handled his loss helped me better understand him as a human being. The focus of my research, the focus of this video, is on Shibao's work as a writer for video games. I've found that my focus on that one part of his life colors my perception of the rest. Knowing that his creative career was cut short after Lagaya, and knowing how deeply that affected him, I find myself painting Shibao's life after Lagaya with a broad brush as a kind of dismal aftermath. But I know that's only part of the story. Shibao lived for nearly two decades after Lagaya was released, and he crammed those 20 years with multiple lifetimes worth of adventure. His adventures earlier in life had served him well as a game designer, giving him a well-rounded and worldly perspective. But after the games were done, the adventures remained, ends unto themselves. No matter how old someone is, if they can't maintain the ability to discover new and interesting things, and they're dead in the water. So I am certainly sad that we did not get more JRPGs written by Hidenori Shibao. That's a loss for all of us. 
but sadness when you're discussing someone so vibrant, so alive, is just not the right tone. If any human being lived well, it was Hidenori Shibao. And as sad as I am about the games he never got to make, I'm even more glad about the interesting life that he got to live. I set out to make a video about the first JRPG I ever played, but I ended up making a video about the man who wrote it. That's due in large part to the grace of the Internet Archive, the fact that Shibao's blog is preserved in an ephemeral web of caches and stray crawls. I don't think I can adequately convey just how delighted I was to discover the ways Shibao's blog changed and grew over time. It clearly started as a kind of gimmick, but it quickly grew into something much more intimate. It's true that I had so many ideas when I first launched this site. To strike out on my own, to operate as a calling card of sorts, to network online both publicly and privately, to understand the world of the internet by participating in it myself. All of those reasons are still true. But as I write about this event, my father's passing, I realize there is more to it than that. Writing about my life in a public forum is natural for me. It comes to me as naturally as waking up, having a cigarette, brushing my teeth, and washing my face in the morning. If I don't write, I feel off somehow. Like I can't differentiate my day, like I can't digest the day before. It feels like I'm putting up landmarks as I walk. In some way, I might be using it as proof of my life. That's why I write. But it feels like I'm writing some sort of tacky pseudo-autobiography. Hidenori Shibao experienced the internet like a lot of us did in the late 90s and early aughts. It went from a technological novelty to a place where we lived. And his blog presented me with a massive amount of research material. It was daunting to read through it all, but the good kind of daunting. For many, many game developers of Shibao's generation, we don't have extensive diaries to pull from. Researching them is the awful kind of daunting, the kind where you realize some of your questions are unlikely to be answered, no matter how many weeks you spend searching. The folks at Shmuplations do great work translating Japanese developer interviews into English, including some about Linus that I referenced in this video. I pulled even more quotes from John Shapaniak's Untold History of Japanese Game Developers, an incredible primary source, and a genuine triumph of game history preservation. If we don't work to preserve that history, and if we don't support the people doing that work, we risk losing these stories forever, with only buyer's guides to tell us about what video games used to be. At the start of this video, I presented my love for Legend of Ligaya as a kind of caveat, something that I would try and check at the door. But who the fuck am I kidding? I love Legend of Ligaya. I admire Hidenori Shibao. I'm not neutral and I don't want to be. I'm invested all the way, DPB. He is uh, DPB, Dick and the Peanut Butter. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I want you to play Legend of Ligaya, and I think you'd have a pretty good time if you did. But I think even more than that, what I want really is for you, specifically you, to make something strange, to write something daring, compose something mind-boggling, draw something that shows me a window into a world that I have never imagined, that I never could have imagined. I love Ligaya, but I want some new hometowns, and I want you to make me earn them. Thank you so much for watching my short, tiny, abbreviated video on Hidenori Shibao. I haven't checked the time code, I think it's like six, seven minutes long. I chose my darling friend Brett Glassberg to be the voice of Shibao. It seemed perfect to me. They both just have sweet hearts and wild, gory imaginations. And obviously, Brett crushed it, as you just heard. As I mentioned in the video, I don't speak Japanese, but I got a lot of things translated for me by Michael Blaskowski, who was 
really great to work with. Friendly, professional, accurate. I, I cannot recommend him enough if you're looking for a Japanese translator. I mentioned Zach Wood in the video. He was kind enough to share his correspondences with Shibao and to introduce me to a gentleman named Andrew Klim, who was kind enough to share his personal experiences with Shibao. Shibao clearly meant a lot to both of them, and I hope I did them proud in the video. I'm not a big outdoor theory guy, and I wanted to highlight some of Shibao's collaborators, but I could only highlight so many. I just wanted to briefly mention that his games were stacked in the staffing department. On Linus 2, in monster graphic design, Shuji Imai did the monster illustrations. Atsushi Domoto also did graphics for the Linus 2 monsters. He's done graphics for a ton of games, jumping from 2D to 3D. He actually did a bunch of assets for Animal Crossing New Horizons. And Takeshi Kaiji directed the monster graphics. You might know him as the producer of a small game called Demon's Souls. So, like I said, just incredible people working on these video games. And yeah, believe it or not, I had to leave a lot out of this video. For example, Leonardo DiCaprio owns a copy of Paladin's Quest for the Super Nintendo, for reasons that are much too arcane and convoluted to get into in this little ending ramble. So be sure to check the description for the extended bibliography. You'll find the links to Shibao's blog in there, as well as all the songs I used and the videos and channels that I pulled from. In particular, I want to shout out Gab Smolders. You saw her in the video, Let's Playing The Fear. She actually translated the game with English subtitles just for her Let's Play, and I think it's the only English translation there is of The Fear, which is kind of incredible. You should definitely check out her videos and her channel and that particular Let's Play if you're interested in truly one of the strangest games on the PlayStation 2. I don't actually know what my next video essay is going to be about. I'm thinking a little bit about multi-user dungeons and about fighting fantasy game books. And if you want to find out what that next video is about, I checked with my legal team and it is still not illegal to subscribe to me. We're not sure about liking the video and leaving comments. That That's a legal gray area, but I would still encourage it. So until next time, money is fake, arm the homeless.